We'll take a look at some garden-related programs that are making a big impact on the environment around us. That's all coming up next, so stay with us. I'm Alan Smith. In today's show, we're going to focus on hand-picked favorites. Now you may think I'm going to run out in the vegetable garden and pick some lovely produce like these tomatoes. Well, not quite. You see, today's show is about hand-picked garden-related programs that are making a big impact on the environment in terms of ways they affect the health and beauty of our communities. Now our first stop is the University of California at Santa Cruz's Organic Farm. It's an outdoor classroom. And what these students are learning is amazing. We'll catch up with them in just a bit. We'll also go to Barberton, Ohio, where we saw the American Bloom Contest at work. Find out why this is a competition where everyone wins. Plus, I want to take you to Mountain View, Arkansas, the folk music capital of the world, where we'll find out about our gardening past. Trust me, you don't want to miss that. We had a lot of fun at the Ozark Folk Center in Mountain View, and we also learned a lot. But right now, let's head out to California and discover what these student farmers are learning. That's right after the break, so don't go away. It's hard to beat fresh organic produce, but believe it or not, this all-natural style of farming has rigorous science behind it. You see, there's so many standards and regulations that farmers must meet in order to call their crop organic. At the University of California at Santa Cruz, they've taken this cause to heart, and you might say they're growing a special crop all their own, young farmers schooled in the craft of organic farming. At UCSC, Christophe Bruneau is helping to train the next generation of organic farmers. Christophe tells us a bit about the work the students are doing here on the farm in Santa Cruz. What we hope to do and what we're trying to accomplish here is training people how to grow plants in a what we feel to be sustainable and sound, environmentally friendly manner. Um, the ways in which that is applied in the world are, are quite varied. Um, really only a small percentage of the folks who come through this program actually go on to be small-scale production farmers, but there is definitely a good contingent of people who do that. There's also quite a lot of folks who come through this program and then do international development work, either on a policy level or on an on-the-ground level, urban gardening context. And I feel like, especially at this point in time, with so many folks living in the city, that's a very important role that we can play. Typically, the number of apprentices that we have is about 35 folks per year. And the program has originally started off quite a bit smaller than that expanded out to about 40 apprentices a year. Now we're at about 35, 36, and we're looking at possibly reducing the size, even though there's a tremendous demand. In terms of who actually comes to the program, there's a pretty broad gamut of folks with a broad gamut of background and experience. Most, well, probably 50% or so come from the West Coast, and the majority of those from California. The balance come from around the country, a fair representation from the northeast, from the southeast, from the southwest, and the midwest as well. Um, and then each year we typically have anywhere from one to four or so international folks. For me this is a great blend of many of my different interests, being able to grow both food and flowers to do work with perennial plants, um, both ornamental plants as well as fruit and nut bearing trees, um, to be able to participate in all of those growing aspects, but at the same time to work with a group of folks who are really interested and motivated to improve their own skills and knowledge base and for me to be able to share what I know and then continually be learning more from the place and from the people too is, is a great opportunity. Up next, a program that's working to beautify America. And a little later, I'll share with you a colorful Cape Daisy at a flower showplace. A few
few years ago, I visited Barberton, Ohio during their annual Mumfest. The array of fall colors was just outstanding. It was during this trip I learned about a program that is helping to make communities all across America more colorful and beautiful. It's called America in Bloom. Delilah Onifree tells us more. America in Bloom is a national beautification campaign and contest modeled after Canada's communities in bloom. Population categories compete and they are evaluated by a team of professionally trained judges and evaluated on eight criteria, half of which are related to landscapes. The overall goal is to use landscaping to create better environments, better places to live. When people live in a place that looks nice, you know, that creates a better business environment, better for community interaction, for people to come together. So when people demonstrate this kind of pride, it shows that they care about where they live. And when you have that, as far as making new things happen and changes for the better, you've got a really good base to start from. Well, Barberton, that's a really good example of the Mum Fest they have. I mean, the whole community comes together to put that on. We've got, you know, the commercial sponsor, the Yoder Brothers, which breeds the mums, and then all the community groups make it happen. And it's a fundraiser for the beautification efforts in the city and other programs. And um, so every fall, this is something everybody looks forward to. Just the whole place is ablaze with beautiful mums, and there's rides and it's just a really good thing. You know, it's so good to see people encouraging positive change in their communities with plants. Plants like these Cape Daisies. Up next, we'll meet a plant breeder and learn about these beauties and some of the other plants I'm enjoying in my garden. So stay with us. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. In today's show, we're talking about hand-picked favorites. It doesn't mean we're going to spend a half an hour on fruits and vegetables. You see, it's all about wonderful programs that are springing up across the country that are garden-related, and they're making a big impact on the environment. So, in my book, they're favorites. Earlier in the show, we visited an organic farm program in Santa Cruz, where they're training the next generation of organic farmers. We also how communities are becoming more beautiful places through a contest called America in Bloom. Right now, I want to take you to a flower show place where I handpick some favorites that I'm enjoying in my garden. These are Cape Daisies, or sometimes called Osteospermums. I think Cape Daisy is much easier to remember. They're beautiful little plants, and I want you to notice something about them. They have unique eyes or centers. Some of them are even blue. So Carl, this Cape Daisy has become very popular in American gardens. Can you tell me a little bit about their origin? Yes, uh, they are coming from South Africa, but uh, no of this has seen their home country because they are all bred in uh, Denmark. Uh, I come from Denmark and the name Cape Daisy, we have given them because they uh, come original from South Africa. Yes, well they're absolutely gorgeous. I can't believe all the colors to choose from. Carl, why are these such good flowers for American gardens? Uh, they are very good early spring flowers. Uh, they uh, uh, flower through the spring and the beginning of the summer maybe they have a short stop and uh, this stop we try to reduce also with our breeding work and then uh, after the summer they always come again and uh, stay very nice in the uh, autumn, in the autumn. I see, so it's a flower that really likes cool temperatures. Uh, yes, uh, this uh, we must say yes to, uh, but uh, we, in our breeding work, we try to uh, reduce uh, this uh, problem so they also can uh, take uh, higher temperatures. I see. You know, I have to say, I really get a kick out of visiting these flower show places where they showcase all these new varieties. In fact, I've dedicated a part of my garden where I plant many different varieties and observe them throughout the growing season to see how they perform. 
My rondelle or round garden contains four beds that I fill with great abundance. In the back of the border, in front of the boxwood hedges, I plant taller plants such as cannas. I've become really attracted to the broad foliage and range of colors cannas can provide. Why, just look at this variety called Tropicana, and this one called Black Knight. Pretty impressive, huh? In the middle of the borders, I like to put a medium-sized plant in that will mix and mingle well, such as Verbena bonariensis, Coleus. Grasses like purple fountain grass will work here, as well as variegated miscanthus grass. In the front of the borders, I like to plant low and cascading varieties, plants such as sweet potato vine, verbenas, as well as inyas, lantana, and begonias. Sure, it takes a lot of work to create such a lush border planting, but the results are worth it. And by finding out what works best in a trial situation, I know what to order next year to try in other parts of my garden or in containers. Now, speaking of hard work in the garden, this reminds me of some viewer mail I got this past week from Ruth in Kansas City. Now, she writes, I love gardening, but lately my hands feel so tired after pruning. I'm in my 50s and have a touch of arthritis. Have you come across any tools that might make gardening easier on me? Well, Ruth, you know, I regard gardening as an activity that we can enjoy our entire lives. Many tool companies like this one, Fiskars, are coming up with ergonomic tools that are especially designed to be easy on the joints. Now another thing you can do to make working out in the garden easier is to keep your tools in good repair. Blades sharpened, hinges oiled, you get the picture. One way I came up with to keep my tools clean and handy is to place them in a sand bucket. Now you see I start by filling a bucket with dry sand and then I pour about a half a gallon of mineral oil evenly over the top. Let it sift through and then push your tools in. One of the great things about this idea is that the coarseness of the sand serves like sandpaper. It keeps debris off the tools. And of course, the oil keeps the water from damaging the metal. What I like about using this project in my garden is that it's become a permanent home for my hand tools and I always know where they are as long as I put them back in the right place. Now let's go back to ergonomic tools and tools that are easier on your joints. You know, I actually have some information on gardening with arthritis on my website, pallensmith.com. So you might want to check it out. And while you're online, sign up for my free weekly newsletter, where I encourage you to write in with any questions you might have. Okay, after the break, a story about a gardening destination perfect for the whole family. The Ozark Folk Center, where our gardening past comes alive. Stay with us. You know, kids love to garden. They want to jump in and help, and I've found the perfect place for them. It's hands-on, it's interactive, it's the Ozark Folk Center in Mountain View, Arkansas. Here you can find a rustic log cabin just like our pioneer ancestors used to live in, and get your hands dirty, or clean as the case may be. Here's my friend Tina Marie Wilcox to explain what she's doing. This is bouncing bed, Alan. Bouncing bed is, is a Saponaria officinalis. Soapwort. Soapwort. It was officially used as a medicine. It makes a good lather and rinses clean. Beautiful. So it was used to, to wash fine textiles. I see. Before and so it, it was, was used it, for baby hands. So it was brought here from Europe. Yes, it was. I see. And, and so it's, it's made a, a home here. And, and, and it makes beautiful pink flowers, so it's, it's nice, but it escaped in my garden <laughs> to such a degree that I have to thin it and wash my hands often. Now, I've grown it before in my garden, and it tends to flop. Yes, as it, as it comes into flower, it does flop over, yeah, and then it yeah. spreads out to that place and takes some more ground. Well, I have to say I've never used it to wash my hands, but now I know I something. Know. Yeah, I know how to use it now. What are some of the other herbs that you have here at the Ozark Folk Festival that were important with our pioneer forebears? Well, during the, during the folk festival time is in the fall of the year, and so what we're, we would concentrate right now on some of the plants that would be harvested this time of year, sure. like the native sunflowers. Right. This sunflower would be a good protein source for early settlers and also for the birds of course. that were coming through and a source of oil. And not to mention beauty in your garden. That's right. And then the, the rose geraniums are lovely baked in cakes. The bruised leaves, if they're just bruised as I've been doing these, I will put them with, with sugar 
overnight in the refrigerator and the sugar will take on the flavor and, and then I can discard the leaves and have the sugar flavored by the roast geraniums. So if the recipe called for sugar, you could use sugar that's scented with rose geranium in the recipe and have a rose scented pound cake. <laughs> yes, I could and, and have a, a Victorian tea if I wish. <laughs> Great. Well, I once read about a recipe uh, for a lemon cake. I think it was actually a, a recipe that was dated from before the Civil War where they used lemon balm leaves and lined the pan and then poured the batter into it and then the, of course the essential oils infused into the cake as it they, rose. Yeah. That's right and then you just get rid of the leaves from around yeah. there and ice it so as So you, you're, you're familiar with you're that familiar. technique as well? Yes, okay. I'm sure. I like food. Well I may have heard it from you. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I have some southern wood that was a European plant that was brought here on purpose because it keeps moths out of your drawers. An artemisia. Yes. Yes. So it's got a bitter, bitter taste. Yeah. It was a vermifuge for getting rid of intestinal worms. <laughs> and young fellers would give this as, in a bouquet to their little sweetheart girlfriends because it was so bitter. And the poem would be to play amidst the sweets any child could do, but to flourish in the bitterness of the wormwood is a sure sign of our true fidelity. Wow. <laughs> so it was very important, as you can see. It made liniments for horses and people. So all the way around, it's, it's handy to have, but I don't want it in a salad. Yeah. Now, this being an artemisia, gardeners would know some of the other artemisias, probably, yes. like Silver King and Poe's Castle and Huntington's Garden, those silvery varieties. That's right. Yeah. And then here in the Ozarks, the, the artemisia that is most known, and I have this, some of this out in the garden, Artemisia annua, or Sweet Annie. And it has a very sweet fragrance to it, and the seed was cooked with sorghum molasses to get rid of intestinal worms. Really? So the children could choke it down with the sweet. <laughs> and it was a small seed. It was very good around the farm. Used for the spring worming of the children. Yes. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have today. Thanks for joining me on this show about hand-picked favorites. You know, it's comforting to know that there are programs and places all around this country where the beauty of the garden is making a difference. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers, bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us. And every time the sun comes out, I can't help but smile. Oh, no, I can't help but smile.